Hello everyone, my name's Adam and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Big Tree Tech SKR E3 version 1.2. This is a 32-bit control board from Big Tree Tech, which is for the Ender 3. Today I'm going to show you how you can upgrade your Ender 3 from the original standard 8-bit control board to this new, better SKR E3 32-bit control board. And then after that we're going to do a print comparison. So identical prints, identical machines, identical filament, and we'll see which one prints better. I think the results are quite interesting. So let's get started with the upgrade. If you've been using the printer recently, the first thing you need to do is turn it off, remove the power plug, and wait for the screen to go off. This should only be a couple of seconds. Next, I'm going to remove the print surface just because I don't want to accidentally get any grease or anything on it while I'm working on the printer. Now that we're ready to start working on removing the control board, we need to get access to this small little box at the front. On the Ender 3 Pro, this is done from the underside, whereas from the Ender 3, this is done from the top. For the Ender 3 Pro, there are four screws in total, one on the top and three on the bottom. For the Ender 3, the normal one, there's three screws in total and they're all on the top. To get access to these screws, you can simply slide the bed out of the way, just don't do it really fast. To remove the screws themselves, you need a two millimeter hex. So an Allen key or screwdriver with multiple bits will do the job just fine. They're not particularly tight, so they're quite easy to remove. This last screw on the bottom can be a little bit difficult to access, but the printer is not very heavy, so you can just kind of tilt it and that'll be fine. Be a little bit careful when you remove the last screw because there is a fan connected to this panel. So if you are working on it upside down like I am, then it will fall off and you don't particularly want it to tug on the cable if you can avoid it. At this point, it's probably a good idea to take a quick photo or a few photos just around the control board so you have an idea of where all the connectors go and exactly what yours look like before removing them all and forgetting where they're all supposed to go. At this point, you might notice the inclusion of hot glue around all of the connectors. This is not necessarily much of a standard practice, but it is something Creality do quite a lot. The difficulty for us is that we now need to remove that glue without damaging all the wires in that process. I don't know many great ways to get rid of this glue. I just tried to pull it off. So I use a pair of small pliers or side cutters to grip the glue. And instead of just trying to pull it directly because you might damage something, if you twist and kind of roll it off, it reduces the strain on the connectors and the wires. So you should be able to do it without too much difficulty. One thing to be aware of while doing this is you need to be a little bit careful not to like apply any force inwards towards the board because if you slip and you cut any traces or damaged components, although we're replacing the board, it might be a good idea to try and not damage it on its way out. On the larger blobs like this, where it's difficult to kind of do any of this rolling to try and get it off, you can just try and cut away the glue right next to the connector so that you can pull the connectors off and then remove the glue afterwards or you can probably just leave the glue on there to be honest. As always when removing connectors try to pull from the connector housing rather than from the wire. You don't want to damage the wire on the way out because we will be using these wires and connectors again exactly as they are. If I can't reach it with my fingers then I tend to use a plastic pry tool to help remove that connector. I'm going to remove the excess hot glue from the connectors as well. I just don't want it there. It's in the way. It looks horrible. So just get rid of it. But be careful. While you're working on removing that hot glue, let me just show you the sort of thing we're trying to achieve. The layout of these two boards is basically identical. So all the connectors will be replaced in their exact same position, but just on the new board. So we are trying to preserve all the connectors as much as we can. So all we need to do is basically unplug everything, remove the old board, place in the new one and plug everything back in. It really is that simple. Next, we're working on these screw terminals down at the bottom. Fortunately, they've not put glue on the screws themselves, so we can unscrew those quite easily. And the hot glue doesn't actually seem to be holding anything in. So yeah. Also, it's worth noting that there seems to be solder on the end of these wires, and you really don't want to put solder in a screw terminal like this. So before putting these back into the new control board, I'm going to be cutting and stripping the ends to make sure that it's just wire and no solder. Again, I'm removing the hot glue as we go just to tidy things up. Continue to remove the connectors and the hot glue until everything is unplugged from the control board. Once you've got all the wires disconnected, simply take the whole bundle and just sort of move it down out of the way. 
Also, the cable for the LCD and the ZN stop, again, just move them out of the way. The control board is mounted with four screws, again, the 2mm hex, so same tool as before. And you can just simply unscrew these and you'll be able to remove the whole control board. Now just take the new control board, put it back in its place and use the same screws to hold it down. Unfortunately, mine didn't actually fit quite right. I mean, this control board is designed to fit in this exact printer, so it should fit perfectly, but unfortunately it didn't. So the cutout at the front, I need to use a small needle file just to cut that back a little bit. So the SD card uh, mount, if you like, can fit nicely as it should do. When I did this upgrade for my standard Ender 3, it did fit perfectly, but here on the Ender 3 Pro, it's just not quite right. Now that the slight modification has been made, I can try again with the screws, and this time it fits just fine. As I mentioned before, some of these cables are soldered, which are going into screw terminals, which we don't really want, so I'm just going to cut the ends off and restrip them to about the same length, so we can use the same screw terminals, but without the solder. All we need to do now is really very simple. We're just going to take all the connectors which we unplugged and plug them back into the control board in the same place. So we've got the four motors down the left hand side, the power input right at the bottom, bed and extruder and fan output down the right hand side with the screw terminals, and then up on the top right hand side we've got end stops, thermistors and a couple of fans. Of course you can use the photos that you took at the start to help you plug everything back in in the same place. Once you've got everything plugged in, or even before, if you remember, you can add the heat sinks to the top of the stepper drivers. Because they get quite warm during operation, they need a heat sink to help them cool down, and obviously the fan on the box will help that cooling process as well. So you simply need to take off the top of the sticker, keep the thermal pad on there, and then press it down gently but sort of firmly onto the top of each of the stepper drivers. The stepper drivers are these small square black chips which are just next to each of the motor connectors. If you have a zip tie available, it's best to try and bundle up the wires as they were before. That just makes sure they're out of the way and you can still get decent airflow. It's not obviously essential for functionality, but it will help in the long term. The LCD cable again just plugs back in the top as it did previously. Once everything's connected, you need to replace the cover. Place it back over the top, but press it down, being careful not to squish any cables or clamp them in any small spaces, and then screw everything back in as before. Again, three screws on the bottom and one on the top. Try not to forget any. To get you back to where you started, place the print surface back on the bed, plug in the power, and you can turn it on and check that everything's working. Firstly, I check that the two thermistors are reading properly, which they are, they're about room temperature. And then I did an auto home just to check all the end stops and everything are sensing as they should be. And then you can probably get on with testing the heaters and then go for a print. So that should get you sorted for the upgrade process. It shouldn't take you too long and there's only a few screws, so it is quite simple. Unfortunately, as we've seen here, in some instances, you will need a needle file in order to do this. So you can expand that SD card slot a little bit, but again, only takes a couple of minutes as long as you've got the right tools. So now let's take a look at print comparison. We're going to take a look at identical filaments, identical G code, one end of three with the standard 8-bit control board and one with this new upgraded 32-bit Big Tree Tech SKR E3 version 1.2. <sighs> That's a bit of a mouthful. So the Ender 3 Pro will be on the left and is equipped with the original 8-bit Melzi board, whereas on the right we'll have the 32-bit Big Tree Tech SKR E3 version 1.2 with the standard Ender 3. For all of the tests, identical G-code was used. It was literally copy and pasted from one SD card to the other. The same filament was used from the same brand with the same color, and so all of that was basically identical. Both printers were adjusted to have their bed level correct before starting any of the prints, and the firmware settings were confirmed to be identical for all of the motion related settings, such as steps per millimeter, acceleration, velocity, etc, etc, etc. First off, we'll take a look at this cube. I did find it unfortunately quite difficult to take side by side pictures of this, just because it's a single plane and I don't have a macro lens and all this kind of stuff, but I think both look really pretty good. I'm not seeing any major differences between the two though. They seem to be basically identical. There does seem to be a very slight shimmer to the one on the right, perhaps indicating that it printed very slightly hotter. So maybe that's a difference in the thermistor, very 
I mean, it's very, very slight. But this probably wouldn't have been caused by the distance between the 8-bit and 32-bit control board. Next, we'll take a look at this tower. Both have a fair bit of stringing, especially in the helical second section. The rounded faces look very, very similar. The bases look similar. The tips look, again, very similar. This small bulge on the left side at the base of the point does seem a little bit more pronounced on the left. Again, this is probably not from the control board, but it, I mean, it is very difficult to tell. Overhangs look very similar. If anything, a little worse on the right, especially at the spherical section just above the helix. Next, we'll take a look at the Gear Anderson Cat. I did forget to enable supports in the G-code for this, and so they both got identical G-codes, and therefore the chin of the cat looks terrible on both. But they do look equally terrible. So, again, very, very similar. Overall, still remarkably similar. Any issues I can identify on the left are repeated on the right. From the front, the chest pattern looks, again, very equal. Layer issues, again, seem to be repeating from the left to the right. Stringing between the ears on both cats is very similar. Again, this word similar is coming up a lot. Around the back, we can see the glossiness of that 32-bit slight overheating. Again, looking a little bit shinier. For the benchy, it's really the same story. Layer artifacts are all in the same place, so everything looks the same, left and right. The string looks the same. Both overhangs look the same. The cooling performance on the chimney and arches, again, very, very, very similar. So, in summary then, will a 32-bit control board improve your print quality immediately just by doing an upgrade? Well, no. Not really. I don't think so. The evidence here, comparing the two Ender 3s, suggests that as long as the G-code is the same, the print is going to be basically identical. There were some very minor discrepancies, but to be clear, one of these was an Ender 3 Pro and one of these was a standard Ender 3. So why would you upgrade to 32-bit then? Well, it's quieter typically a lot quieter because the stepper drivers can use a better refinement they can use smaller steps that generates a lot less vibration and therefore generates a lot less noise secondly there's a lot more space in the memory to write firmware so more features can be enabled therefore having maybe a more complex feature set and potentially producing better prints or better ease of use as a result you also can get built-in SPI and UART capabilities that can be enabled, which can give you improved serial interface, which is in two directions between the controller and the stepper driver. So for more advanced features like skip step detection and stuff like that, this requires those serial interfaces because they need the two-directional communication. And lastly, you typically will get a more responsive interface with 32-bit. Again, this faster processor being more capable means calculations can be done quicker. So for selecting files and just generally moving around in the menus, it's typically a lot quicker, a lot more responsive. If those features don't sound important to you, then maybe 32-bit is not a necessary upgrade for you at the moment. But you don't really lose anything, especially as 32-bit boards are coming down in price significantly. So it may be something you want to consider for your next printer, if not an upgrade for this one. So that's going to be it from me today. Hopefully this was helpful for you, especially if you're taking a look at the Big Tree Tech SKR E3 version 1.2 or something very similar. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you in the next one.